You cannot go on stage again in your condition. I love you, but I won't stand by and watch this nutty tour put you in a wooden box. I knew nothing about Lucille at all. I didn't know of her existence. And um, Laurel and Hardy, just from growing up, it was always on the television on a Saturday morning. So I kind of grew up with just, that's what the family did, just gathered and watched that on Christmas morning. Um, so I had to learn all about Lucille for the, for the part. I think it was a very romantic relationship they had. <clears throat> from what she said, I, I got a little bit of footage of her speaking as an older woman and it sounded like she was very much in love with him. So it's very difficult to watch the love of your life, you know, fading and changing and ill health taking over, but his strength to perform is still there, it's all consuming. So it's a battle inside of her. That's Martin Hannett, the only bona fide genius in this story. Well, one of the only two bona fide geniuses in this story. He's quite shy sometimes, is Steve Coogan. Mm -hmm. um, He's uh, fantastic to work with. I've worked with him for the last 20 years, every so often. Um, and in fact, I've just been working with him last week as well. Um, he's amazing to work with, very exciting, um, a master at improv, um, just uh, it, and, and morphing into somebody else, becoming somebody else. A very, um, just everything you would want, really. Uh, most of the stuff I've done with him is, it has been with Michael Winterbottom. And the way he works, which is very improvised based, Steve uh, um, does the same and just, it's just great, great fun. And uh, I, I always go back for more. Where does she come from? From every bed in Paris. You know, we didn't think she would last long until she married the Comte. And then he was conveniently shipped away somewhere. And she doesn't stay in the boudoir. Oh, no. I, it's, I mean, it's a, a long time ago and I just did a tiny, tiny yeah. little part in that. But it was, it was amazing to meet her um, and to spend some time with her. I mean, she was, I think she'd just done, what was the film she'd done? The Lost in Translation, that was the one she'd just done before. Um, so I was very keen to, <clears throat> to have the meeting. Um, and she was lovely. Um, again, up, kind of up for playing, you know, uh, she, I'd, I'd done my research and in fact I looked absolutely nothing like the character. The, 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 the girl that I was playing was um, much taller, much larger than, than me in real life, the paintings of her. And I was like, why? I couldn't understand why I was, why, what, what she wanted from me, but she just wanted me to come up with something other because it was that kind of a film, wasn't it? Her own slant on it. Um, and I liked her very much. Um, and Steve, we just passed at the gallery of mirrors uh, uh, one day in the scene, but nothing much, yeah. Don't ask me. Here I am, minding my own business, and someone thinks it's funny to throw a book at me. I do get recognised by you, Joe. Um, more so now, actually, than I ever did at the time. Uh, and it's not so much by children, it's mainly by young women in their 20s who have kind of grown up with them. Um, uh, and they were great films to work on. They were very... Um, I could never have imagined being in anything like that. So when that um, interview came along, that was very exciting. And I waited six months actually to to hear that I got the job on that one because they went they went to all the, the schools and I think in the whole of the UK to to audition for. Uh, I, I would try and get a real school girl because um, obviously she's fourteen years of age. Um, and then they came back to me months and months later. Myrtle, she's kind of old and young at the same time. And also I'm dead, so you can kind of look older, like they wash me out, so I don't have to look like a really fresh 14 year old. Um, but I think it's emotions probably in the end. She's very emotional and full of kind of raging, almost adult emotions that I think probably they just wanted the vocal range as well that you have as, as somebody a bit older. Right. No pressure, Bridge, but your whole future happiness now depends on how you behave on this one social occasion. Right. What should I do? First, look gorgeous. Uh, probably the first, the first film you're, you've got a soft spot for, because it's the beginning, and we're all very young and um, didn't know what that was all about, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's, that, was a, that was probably the best. The, the feeling was the best on that one, probably, yeah. Bridge, I thought you should know after Tom dropped out, Giles asked Mark to be the godfather. What? He did what? Yes, I know, he really is a useless cock. Did it without asking me. It was great fun. I mean, it was a thought, you know. I, I never imagined they would come and do another one. There was such a long time had passed. Um, but we've, it feels like coming home always when you've, when you've done something and even if you've had the long gap and you're all just sitting there together in the makeup truck and you're going to start 
start this all this whole thing up again. It just feels it felt nice, um, and I don't have a big part in it. I'm just dotted about, um, so I'm not there very much. But the scenes that we do do are, are nice and they're good fun. And Renee's just lovely. She's so nice to work with. Um, so it was nice to see the changes in people and everybody's looking great and it, fe it felt very nice just like it like it always was. What are you two talking about? Football! What are what you, you talking, talking about? Shopping! It became a bigger thing than I knew what it was at the time. I hadn't done many... I thought that might have been my second little bit in a film, you know. It took me ten years to get in a film. Um, so. I think I was probably just very grateful to, to, to be in it. I didn't know what it was really. I'd, I'd read the book, um, but again, didn't could never have imagined that it, it became what it was, what, you know, what it did become. Um, we were just it was a it was a very low budget film. We were all crammed into this one little caravan with nothing, you know, and we just went and did our scenes and 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 there was no special treatment. There was we were all just bunched together, um, so. It, even even then, after it, I, I didn't get nobody really knew I was in train spotting. But it's years later, after I've done other uh, lots of other things, people now associate me with train spotting, but not necessarily at, at the time. It was just like a job, you know. It's really strange. <laughs> she thinks I went from McBean because of what he did to you, actually, because of what I feel for, because of what Alex thinks I might feel for. I see you, yeah. Yeah, and Robert, we'd done Hamish Macbeth, the television series together, and Once Upon a Time in the Midlands. And I knew he was his life was changing. I could feel that he was getting into films. I think he'd done something with Ken Loach, and everything was changing for him. And his world was opening up in the film industry, and it was wonderful to watch that. And the same with Ewan McGregor. I mean, he was a lot younger, Ewan. Um, but that beginnings for these guys, it was their film. You know, it was it was going to launch their careers, and and it, and it really did. You know. On Sunday afternoons, a mystery serial tells the story of a girl's obsession with the ocean. Ancestral memories launch her on a voyage of discovery and surprise. I was at drama school in London um, and I was getting to the point where we were going to be leaving and never had a job. Um, so I wrote in my last year hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters to anybody that I thought would be interested in coming to see me in a little play at college. And the play was called Lovers by Brian Friel. And this man came, he actually replied to my letter and he came and he was looking, unbeknownst to me, he was looking for someone to play a part in a little children's television series in Scotland. And uh, he offered me the part. Uh, and then I left drama school early to go and do that. So that's how that came about. Hey, Rob, you know why Calvinists are against shagging standing up? No call, I do not. The fear that might lead to dancing. <laughs> For me, though, all I said was, here's your soup. That's what I said to Rob, Liam, Liam Neeson, who is, is uh, brilliant. You know, he, he came to see me, actually. I was just doing a play recently in, at the Old Vic, and I was working with Kieran Hines, and uh, he came to see Kieran in it, and I, said, and he was, I was introduced to him, and I said, uh, oh, we've met before, you don't remember, but it was up a mountain in Scotland, and I gave you some soup <laughs> all those years ago. Um, but he was a, he's a nice chap, yeah. Others. He's right. The doctor's right. We can't let him. Oh, Mr. Skinner. Bridget. Pull. No. For Get God's up. sake. Pull. If it's the last Get thing up. we ever do. Please. All of us together. Come on. I didn't really like Doctor Who growing up because I found it really scary. I used to hide behind the, the settee, the sofa, um, and or go outside to play. We always used to just go out to play when I came in from school. Um, there was a time when kids used to play outside. <laughs> That's what we did. Um, so I wasn't really a fan of Doctor Who growing up, but I enjoyed it as an adult. I got, got into it for a little while as an adult, yeah. When I was a kid, I always thought she was like, real doll, you know? And now she's so tiny. Kind of freaks me out. I had a film out recently called Never Steady, Never Still, which is a little Canadian film. And it's a woman who's got Parkinson's disease and her, and her son, and uh, and they just they live out in the wilds in Canada, and it's, I thought it was a, a lovely script. I mean, it was a tough job to to do, not not the easiest job, um, but that kind of film, it's not going to have 
you know, it's not going to get into all the big cinemas. I mean, it might do, you, you might be lucky, somebody might pick up on it. But that's the sort of thing um, that it's very hard to, to get out there. So films like that, and I've done quite a lot of small independent films that are, it's, you know, it'd be nice if, if there was, sometimes they might do better on television than the cinema.